quite strange. I mean, so many of you are just so glued to that uh, screen there that you, or should I say maybe they are like, the uh, gossip of Bakus are many here tonight. They will never drop the offerings, would they? It doesn't really matter. Let's continue. Okay. So here we go. Bola Hamed Tinumbu, the origin story. A U.S. district court would seem like an odd place to begin this story. But this is no ordinary story. The main character in this story is an individual whose entire existence is as puzzling or puzzlingly mysterious as it is loud and public. For at least 30 years, Bola Hamed Tinumbu has been at or near the grinding face of frontline politics in Nigeria. Yet, a peak one inch below the surface reveals how little is actually known about the man who some say is Nigeria's president in waiting. First of all, there is the age controversy. How old is the man really? What is his real uh, date of birth? Short answer, no one actually knows. Like many Nigerians born into the less than auspicious circumstances that char I mean, characterize this childhood in a Rugby or Shun state, he himself may not even know. Similar controversies exist around what his actual name is. A popular theory is that Bola Ahmed Tinumbu is an identity that he transitioned into at some point after moving to Lagos to live with his surrogate mother, Alihaja Abibatu Mogaji. That's her there. Now, the only thing every version of his life story has in common is that for the first two decades, 20 years or so, he was apparently invincible and unmemorable. There are no childhood friends, classmates, neighbors, or colleagues that remember him. Sometime in the mid-1970s, he somehow materialized as the international airport. Sorry, he somehow materialized at the international airport in Lagos, holding a passport with a U.S. visa and a one-way ticket to Chicago in hand. From his arrival in Chicago in 1975, his story became easier to track and verify. He first spent two years gaining an associate degree at Richard J. Daly College in Chicago. From there, he proceeded on Chicago State University where he studied accounting, completing his bachelor's degree in 1979. Subsequently, his story appeared straightforward and uh, prosaic. Got a job as an accountant at Mobile Nigeria Limited in Fairfax, Virginia got married to Oluremi and went on to have three kids with her. Well, after, you know, three fruitful indiscretions, shall we say, you know, like other kids like that, right? Apart from Remy. In a 2016 interview with uh, the news, Tinumbu claimed that his break into the financial big time came at the big four consultancy firm, Deloitte and Tuche where he supposedly received an $850,000 bonus as a result of his work on a single on-site engagement at the Saudi state-owned oil firm. Well, how did you get job in Mobi? This is where he stated at home. Tiff Numbu's The News interview. Right? But let's proceed the truth. For anyone with even a passing knowledge of corporate consulting remuneration, the categorical dishonesty in the screenshot above needs no explanation. For everyone else, here is a current breakdown of the maximum amount a partner, the highest attainable position can realistically expect to hand at uh, the lighter US. Total, 575000 and that must be somebody at the partnership level. Now, continue. Bearing in mind that uh, the time period in question was sometime in the mid-1980s, $850,000 adjusted for the roughly 2.74% annual dollar inflation rate 
over the intervening 37 years come to about $2.3 million in today's money. Even more incredibly, Tinubu claimed that he was awarded such a bonus when he was essentially less than five years into his career as an accountant, never mind making a partner. While the interview in question contains several other giant fibs, this one stands out specifically because it is the first time in the Tifnumbu story where he himself acknowledge or acknowledges and tries to explain the fact that he once had a lot more money than a simple accountant working 9 to 5 consultancy job could reasonably account for at that point in his career. This point becomes more important later in this story. So remember, subscribe, join, and all that, right? So in any case, one does not need an economic study or a glass door salary survey to establish that Numbu was blat I mean, blatantly lying about where the $1.8 million sitting in his account came from. A document whose existence has long been teased and rumored, but never quite probably dissect I mean, dissected in the public domain, tells us all we need to know. This document, which was obtained from the U.S. District Court of Northern District of Illinois, Eastern Division, contains damning information that Tinubu has spent the past 30 years trying to suppress, undermine, and ignore. Uploaded in full and pub I mean, publicly ac accessible here, the document contains comprehensive federal indictment and associated cases files from July 1993, containing clear and incontrovertible everyday evidence. The Abola Ahmed Tinubu was once, in fact, a bagman handling and laundering proceeds of heroin trafficking for a Nigerian drug ring in Chicago. So here we have the I mean, court document documenting this in full. Are you with me? Now, continue. This is not the first time that the content of this document has been reported, but the stories have typically not gone into the detail needed to drive home the point that the man who would be Nigeria's next president is in fact a drug criminal. Tinumbu's vast army of media chills and spoke people have spun an endless web of narratives explaining why what is written in black and white is all a big mistake or a mischaracterization. One of the most common defenses is seen in the examples below. Read this. Yeah. Our sincerest greetings to you and all the enforcement plans, blah, 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 blah. The result of the checks were negative for any criminal arrest record, warrant, or warrant for Bola Ahmed Tinumbu, uh, you know, for information of, I mean, of your department, blah, blah, you know, or pretty much uh, the way they are trying to, like, uh, you know, try to water down all of this. Well, I know you love your thieves differently in Nigeria and you worship them, okay? You should just pretty much take your time to know your thieves. Know him better. Don't, don't make up stories to defend them. Don't make it look like uh, everybody will have to embrace the thief, the criminals. So that in the future, when the old things start coming down like this of the Tifnumbu, you are never going to say, ah, but we didn't know now. Abi, hug your thieves and be bold and happy that uh, you are a criminal too. A nebula. Well, you know. Taking advantage of the Nigerian knowledge gap, that typically misunderstands how U.S. federal indictments work and how they differ from criminal convictions. Such narratives have been floating around the Nigerian media ever since. I mean, ever since Tinubu became Lagos State Governor in 1999, explaining the efficiency of indictments in the U.S. H. Michael Sternberg, a founder of the Sternberg Colorado Criminal Defense Law Firm, says, "In quote, what are the chances for a not guilty verdict?" If a federal, federally charged criminal defendant takes the case to trial, statistically not very good. Currently, federal prosecutors tout above a 95% uh, conviction rate. This is primarily due to the fact that uh, most cases never make it to trial. Most defendants end up taking a plea bargain rather than risk a potentially much greater prison sentence, which could be dealt them if they actually went to trial and lost. Of course. Now, this is what, where the plea bargaining came in. In other words, America's feds are very good at their jobs, and the likelihood of a federal indictment not being accurate is roughly 5%. Basically, not very much. But could Tinumbu perhaps have been part of that 5%? And if not, what happened that prevented the conviction? Here we go. 
among the dozens of documents in the case file, there is a sworn, uh, there is a sworn statement by IRS, IRS Special Agent Kevin Moss, who personally investigated Bola Tinobu's financial, financial activities in the lead up to lead, uh, I mean, sorry, to Lee Edwards' uh, arrest. Here, we reunite you with our old friends, Abiodun Agbele and Adegbo Yega Muiz Akonde, as we pick our way through our hero's forbidden past. Who is this man on your screen? That is Abiodun Agbele, the guy who was running the heroin sale, smuggling from Nigeria, and Tifnumbu, laundering the money for them by helping them to clean the drug money. A place where he also invested the money in Nadeko, the struggle for the Yoruba, uh, what do you call it, for the MK Wabiola uh, mandate and the rest of that. Now, that is your guy, Agbele. In the interest of uh, brevity, here is a Cliff Notes version. The U.S. attorney for the Northern District of Illinois, Michael Shepard, files the complaint for forfeiture of funds in bank accounts held by Tinumbu as they owed the proceeds of a heroin distribution organization headed by Adigbu Yega Zakande. Tinumbu's funds represent the proceeds of this operation or property involved in money laundering and the proceeds of narcotics trafficking. Shepard requests that the, count, I mean, the court adjudge and decree that the funds should be forfeited to the United States. And this is the document making the request. Special Agent Moss has analyzed financial documents, including bank, bank statements, money orders, cashier checks, tax returns, and wire transfers of huge amount of cash generated by individuals who are believed to be members of this heroin distribution organization. And he reaches a professional conclusion that the accounts controlled by Tinumbu were involved in financial transactions representing proceeds of drug trafficking. The investigation, which began in 1998, um, 1988 rather, has identified Adegbo Yegamu Izakonde and his nephew, Abiodun Agbele, as key figures in the trade and distribution of heroin. The investigation identifies the third individual working with the duo to launder their money as a certain Bola Tinumbu. In December 1989, Akonde takes Tinumbu to a first heritage bank to open an individual money account. On the application, Tinumbu gives his address as 7504 South Stewart Avenue, Chicago, which is the same address Akonde uses as his heroin trap house. Special Agent Moss discovered that Mrs. Oluremi Tinumbu has previously opened a joint account at the same bank with Audrey Akonde, wife of Adegbo Yega Muiz Akonde. Now, from that report, this is it, where Tinumbu's wife, Akonde's wife, they used, including Tinumbu, to go and open different accounts they will be using to deposit the heroin money that they would then launder. You know what I mean, but let's continue. On January 4, 1990, just five days after opening the account, Tinumbu deposited uh, deposits $80,000 into it. Remember that uh, Tinumbu's salary as an accountant in America was $2,400 a month. Now, this is where he got access to money. 1990 was mad. That's the, that's the quote, remember? 1990s was mad. Oh, your favorite, your heroes, they are drug, drug barons, drug dealers. Do you know? They are not heroes. I know you love your thieves again. You are worshipping your thieves. Enjoy them. But please, eh? don't let your children be like you. For God's sake, please. Mm? Please. On January 4, 1990, just five days after opening the account, Tinumbu deposited $80,000 into it on a subsequent credit application dated January 6, 1990. Tinumbu states that he is an employee of Mobile Oil Nigeria Limited with a total monthly salary of $2,400 and no other source of, sources of income. He gives his address as 7504 Southwark, I mean, sorry, uh, South uh, Stewart um, and, and Liz Akonde as his cousin. Despite earning $2,400 a month with no other known source of income, bank records from First Heritage Bank shows that over the course of 1990 alone, Bola Tinumbu deposited $661,000 into his individual account, market account, mm -hmm. 
or individual money market accounts, followed by a further 1.216500, that's $1.2 million in 1991. If you are paying attention, that is roughly equal to the 1.8 million he will later claim to make, I mean, he made from Deloitte bonuses and salary deposit, I mean, salary deposits, right? Look at that there. I got paid all that money from Deloitte, yeah? When Special Agent Moss interviews mobile oil reps about Tinumbu's employment, they confirmed that Tinumbu works at Mobile Oil Nigeria as a treasurer in a capacity that does not involve transfer or custody of large amounts of money. Moss also discovered that Tinumbu has failed to file U.S. income tax returns since 1984. <laughs> this is the one that Tinumbu and Ganga using that. Uh, the money they found in his account was because Tinumbu didn't pay tax. He was a businessman. Or more. You see how they mix them? May God not let them mix and that, you know, mix match your brain. And please don't mix match the brain of your children. It leads to poverty. Look at look around you. Look at poverty around every one of them. Those around him. Can you see that? That's exactly what it does. When they mix, when they mix match your brain together with all debt and rubbish like this. Criminals. Career criminals. On January 10, 1992, a court order is obtained to freeze some of Tinubu's bank account containing the suspected proceeds of heroin trafficking in excess of $1.4 million. On January 13, 1992, during a telephone conversation from Nigeria with Special Agent Moss, Tinubu admits to the agents that he knows Akonde and that he had previously wired Wire transfer, excuse me, wire transfer their $100,000 to Akonde's account in Houston. Further, Tinumbu says that the $80,000 he deposited into the First Heritage Bank came from Akonde. Tinumbu also reveals that uh, he had additional bank accounts in Fo I mean, Fairfax, Virginia, and London, UK. Speaking over the telephone with Special Agent Moss on January 14, 1992, Tinumbu admits that he knows Agbele and that he met him through Akonde. Tinubu admits he has associates. I mean, so he has associated uh, with Agbele and Akonde in the U.S. and Nigeria. In this, I mean, in this conversation, Tinubu denies having any additional bank account in the U.S. Anyway, but going forward, on January 24, 1992, following a seizure warrant to freeze over five hundred thousand dollars of unexplained funds in Tinubu's Citibank account, Citibank discovered two additional bank accounts controlled by Tinumbu under the name of Compass Finance and Investment Company Limited. Citibank's account opening KYC record brings up a memorandum of association and article of organization identifying Akonde and Agbele as directors of Compass Finance and Investment Company Limited. Between January 30 and 31, 1992, Tinubu does an about face and tells U.S. agent that he has never had any business association with or financial relationship with uh, Agbele or Akonde, you know, about on twist. This statement directly contradicts his earlier statement and the documentation from Citibank and First Heritage Bank. Special Agent Moss concludes in his submission that, based upon this evidence, there is probable cause to believe that a number of Tinubu's accounts are involved in narcotics transactions. The court concurs and ordered the forfeiture on August 18, 1993. Tinumbu opts to fight the case, claiming that the money is legitimate and it belongs to his wife, Oluremi Tinumbu, and his surrogate mother, Alaja Abibatu Mogaji. Ultimately, he enters into a settlement with the U.S. government on September 15, 1993, agreeing to forfeit $460,000 of the heroin trafficking proceeds to the U.S. government. The balance of roughly $1 million is then released to him, plea bargaining. Now, why did the U.S. authority adopt this approach? Instead of going the whole org and insisting on litigation so as to obtain the full amount, the U.S. Justice Department's guidelines for asset settlement to settle cases provide the answers in plain English. You know, underlined word in red in this part uh, of... Uh, uh, you know, U.S. Uh, Justice, I mean, Justice Department's guidelines. Settlements to forfeit properties are encouraged to conserve the resources of both the United States and claimant in situations where justice will be served. Right. So, in any case, the ascent of Abasha and this rabid anti-American posturing very quickly led to a shift 
in U.S. government priorities. Anyone who was on board with Nadeko and promoting democracy in the face of Abacha's fascism became an ally. Even if just a few years before, they had contributed to a heroin epidemic in the street of Chicago. As anyone with some knowledge of the CIA Contra, if you have watched that, by the way, CIA Contra cracker cocaine, I mean, cocaine affair, would know even Uncle Sam can turn a blind, blind eye to drug dealers when they are working in his interests. Also, remember, it was the 1990s. The 90s were a crazy time. More O's in the Tinumbu story and a cameo from the kids. The children who spend like their papa. Here we go. At the time when Tinumbu informed the U.S. authority that he was a lowly treasurer at Mobile on $2,400 a month after having apparently been the world's most, most generously remunerated, I mean, remunerated uh, junior Deloitte account, I mean, accountant, he was doing some decidedly non-lowly things in the background. While working on this story, a bit of research across U.S. land registry threw up a few uh, pillars like this from the land records department at Prince George County, Maryland. On January 20, 1992, barely 10 days after Agent Moss made first contact with Tinumbu via telephone, Tinumbu purchased a four-bedroom, 3,016-square-foot home at, you know, 10 uh, one 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 via, I mean, Limestone Court, Potomac, Maryland, 284, I mean, 854 postcode. Uh, for the mystery sum of, uh, sorry, mystery sum of uh, $450,000 paid in full and upfront, by the way. So here is, uh, here is the receipt of that house. But then, and this is the picture of the house. But uh, around that time, once the, uh, you know, once uh, he got the fact that they are coming after him and all that, he quickly started buying properties, which is like, you know, the way it was in the 90s. This was about 10 days before he did his about face I mean, to Agent Moss. Denying having, having a financial relationship with uh, heroin trafficking bodies like Beli and Akonde, the obvious question raised here is one about timing. Was Tinubu attempting to hide money from the U.S. authorities by packing it in real estate once he realized they were on to him? Where did the funds to carry out this transaction even come from at the time when his accounts were being frozen, right? Left and center from drug heroin, of course. Instead of putting the money in the bank, Put it in the estate, real estate. More real estate record searches raise even more questions about several other parts of the accepted Tinumbu story, including his self characterization as a bed ragged hero of a democratic struggle and Nadeko movement under General Sonny Abacha. In the above mentioned interview, he claimed that following Abacha's coup and his eventual exit from Nigeria, he was forced to live almost like a pauper after the Nigerian government trip, I mean, stripped him of all he had, describing him weary but triumphant return home from exile. He said, you know, uh, well, and yet, the Prince, uh, the Prince George County Land Record Department will beg to differ because here was our tragic, uh, impoverished era of democracy, I mean, of uh, the Nadeko uh, struggle, casually dropping the minus sum of $145,000 uh, in 1995 for a three-bedroom, um, 1,668 square foot home at uh, that address there in Maryland. He would go on to trust a tidy $13,000 profit when he sold it just three years later. Steal money from heroin and all of that. Here is another one. Well, that's that property, by the way. Yeah. There is another one. It was at it again in 1997, putting down the modest sum of $491,000 uh, on a 4,558 square foot property somewhere in Maryland as well. Again, all cash. It will go on to sell this property in September 2018 for $700,000, as you can see. Now, is uh, here we go. What is more? This weird tra uh, transaction did not end in 1999 or stop with our hero and his wife, even their two youngest children, Abibati Oyidamola Tinumbu and Zainab Abisola Tinumbu, got in on the act of, uh, I mean, got in the, you know, the act of fairly recently, he said. So, mm -hmm. your money. 
Sunday. Sunday Oponu from Owuru. You are right there now in Owuru. Trying to fight for people who don't give a damn about you. I hope uh, your children will not be like you. I actually really, really do hope. Well, let's continue. Age 32 and 30 respectively. Two of the three youngest members of Ebola Tinubu's family have managed to escape scrutiny. Mostly because freedom of information in Nigeria is still more aspiration than fact. Not so in America, where a plethora of services can pull up all kinds of records, including birthdays, criminal convictions, and real estate transactions, especially real estate transactions, such as the ones where a 25-year-old with no known employment or source of income was able to pay 2.1 million, 2.1 million in 2014 for a deluxe condo at uh, somewhere, you know, at 55 Berry Street, Brooklyn, in New York. So I bet some of you know uh, Zainab in New York. She's a millionaire simply because her father, Tifnumbu, also have no known job other than being the godfather and turning Lagos, uh, uh, you know, Lagos uh, public money to his own azar. So, you know, as uh, the apartment, you can see the inside and everything. All of these things are out there. They are not secret. But in Nigeria, eh? They say, ah, where are you? Uh, Ludo, you have no idea. What a mortgage life on everybody in Bahama. Same thing with, uh, you know, same thing with Abiba. Abiba, hmm? Eh? Mokuna enjoy uh, na Lagos money. The people who are supposed to, I mean, the people your, your parents took this from, their children are currently, they are swimming to school now, for those who can swim. Uh, you know, some of them are swimming to work. Some of them are like uh, the ag bureaus that uh, your father, your parents have uh, sold their future, so to say. So, enjoy them while it lasts. Well, Atinumbu's good fortune, it seems fair to say, could well be genetically transmitted. What are the odds that the only junior accountant in the world to earn an $850,000 bonus on a single engagement will turn out to have children who buy luxury real estate in New York for millions of dollars while being unemployed with no clear source of income? Not great. Well, here we are. Ola Tinumbu, a man of destiny. In the course of researching this story, a name that kept coming up repeatedly as a comparison to Nigeria's Teflon Nashiwaju was a certain Moshud Kashima Wolawale Abiola when the Daily Beast took its stab at this story some years back. In a tantalizing hint was mentioned in passing about an unimaginable parallel between 1993 and 2023. So, drug charges do indeed appear to be the sine qua non for Nigerian eye office. The year 1993, when Tinumbu's assets were seized, was a turbulent period for Nigeria following the cancellation of a national election and the establishment of a military dictatorship. Moshu Dabiola, the rightful owner of that election, was accused of narcotic trafficking, according to Campbell. So, too, is Prince Buru Jikashamu from the People's Democratic Party, who has faced extradition back to the United States since 1998. Kashamu was indicted by a federal grand jury in Chicago for being the elusive allergy, a globetrotting drug campaign who smuggled heroin into Harare International Airport from Europe and Asia. Piper Kaman, the memory staff who inspired the Netflix series Orange is the New Black, famously worked for allergy. Kashamu denies the charges and insists that he was purportedly a counter-terrorism informant to the U.S. government before and after 9-11. <laughs> and that the real trafficker was his now deceased brother. Well, well, well. It's a cutout from uh, the story that uh, reminded us that Chief M.K. Abiola himself was also fingered in narcotic uh, trafficking too. How? I reached out to everyone I could think of with, the, I mean, with some knowledge of the affair. Some declined to speak, citing unspoken concerns. Only Prof. Gary K. Bosk is, uh, I mean, only, 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 sorry, only Prof. Gary K. Bosk, um, a notable African political risk analyst and one time professor of African studies at the University of Hawaii, agreed to say his piece. His lengthy, com his lengthy comment went as follows in quotes The Nigerian military on the council were adamant 
that the Babangida government should never allow Abiola to run for office and told President Babangida so during the aborted runoff primaries before the election. The basis for their concern about Abiola was the information and documentation being circulated in Washington, London, and Lagos of Abiola's alleged ties to the drug business. The U.S. in particular had expressed a strong opposition to IBB about the candidacy of Abiola as president, not because of his politics or allegation of corruption, but rather for the evidence that they felt was correct about Abiola's alleged drugs connections. This issue was raised in the military council on three occasions and Babangida was warned. He refused to take a decision until it was almost too late. U.S. Ambassador Lannon Walker and the British uh, Consul visited IBB and warned him about Abiola, but Babangida dithered, which made the impact worse as the polling had begun. When he finally decided to intervene and stop the election, he precipitated the crisis of June 12. His friends in the military supported him, but were felt let down by IBB's lack of decisiveness. While there was consternation in Nigeria about the ouster of Abiola, the major international partners of Nigeria were not upset or concerned because they know what the reasons were for the development of quote. Was the 1993 election and not because MK Abiola's alleged drug ties? Bola Tinubu for one, who certainly hope not. Not only does he have very real and proven drug ties in addition to explicitly, I mean, explicitly positioning himself as the assumed successor to MKO as the political leader of Nigeria's Yoruba ethnic group, but he has also picked a Muslim running mate ahead of next year's election, the only other electoral frontrunner in Nigeria's history to do that was, no price for guessing, MKO Abiola. Listen to this. Now I am for this life, oh, now so so palama. I tire for this problem, I tire for life, oh, Guinea. No work, no food, no house, no life. Small well, water, then they bring now so so dirty, they pull out. The small money, I they get now so so transport, they chop out. School low, no, now headache, hospital, no work, I tire for life, oh. My brother, waiting you they think oh my sister, hello but don't come S D P M K O in the bed action M K O in the bed S D P progress Abiola na di logo S D P na di party to solve our problem and better our life oh M K O M K O M K O action Abiola 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 progress na he be the hope for better tomorrow. Get um, it is just uh, a refresher. Let's continue. Still, if anybody can manage to avoid having this particular boat of lightning strike twice, it could well be Bola Ahmed Tinumbu, the luckiest politician in Africa. When he needed money to launch a political career in the 90s, after all, he apparently had $1.8 million saved up from bonuses and salary payment as a junior accountant at, at uh, Deloitte, uh, very handy. When his chosen successor faced a near certain electoral defeat in 2007, the more popular frontrunner coincidentally turned up dead inside his bedroom in Dolphin Estate, Ikoyi, one of the safest neighborhoods in Nigeria. He had been strangled to death. Naturally, the chosen successor then won the election Happy coincidence? No. When he backed the candidate against the incumbent president in 2015, his good friend, Gilbert Shaguri, the former kleptomaniac's bagman, happened to have an excellent relationship with U.S. Secretary of State Hillary Clinton. She just happened to ignore recommendations from the State Department and intelligence services to proscribe Boko Haram as a foreign terrorist organization effectively allowing it to gain critical mass and make the government of the day unpopular, his candidate duly won the election. Lucky guy. Do you want me to explain what I mean? Yeah. T 
Tifnumbu is a friend to the Shaguri brothers. Shaguri brothers have ties with Hillary Clinton. Hillary Clinton is the Secretary of State in America. Barack Obama is the president. Tifnumbu is a friend to, to Shaguri. And the Nigerian government under good luck, uh, Jolanta was asking America to help them proscribe uh, Boko Haram as a terrorist organization. America refused to proscribe Boko Haram as a terrorist organization. Why? Because Tifnumbu and gang told them, uh, no, 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 the government needs to look bad. We need to take over for, a, for another terrorist to come and, to the, for the real terrorists to come and take over. That's how the uh, Bukwari emerged. Don't ever forget that. Do not ever forget that. Now, let's continue. When he backed the candidate against it, well, I've said that, lucky guy. Refusal to name Boko Haram a terrorist organization, America chose not to. Tif Numbu used their, I mean, their relationship with uh, uh, Clinton and all of that to make sure that uh, Boko Haram grew stronger in order to make the government of Nigeria look bad, even though thousands of people are killed and are still being killed today. Now, Tif Numbu don't go bring the Boko Haram sympathizer. Una don't enter him. Now, Una go eat him. Enjoy you. If you don't know the international conspiracy and how much, and I mean, how much uh, of uh, what do you call it, damages these guys have done to you, and keeping Nigeria one any longer, how much of the damages is he going to do to you? That's your choice. Listen, it is your choice. Uh, David continued. When a former business partner, Dakbo Akpara, took him to court over financial impro impropriety, and money laundering at Alpha Beta Consultants, basically, is little straw into the Lagos State Treasury. The court became the first court in the history of Lagos to burn to the ground mm -hmm. and have his files destroyed. The case has yet to be refiled, which is absolutely coincidental and very regrettable. Not coincidental. You get what I mean now? And as they say, eh, 1990s were a crazy time. And the 2020s are even going to be crazier. I'm going to take another break before we continue. If you have been with me this long, well, we are currently over 3,000 uh, on YouTube. So if you will take a moment, yeah, to just like the broadcast, engage with it. When I get back, we would continue from here again. <laughs> Now, talking about uh, where they have brought uh, Nigeria and how much uh, further destruction they are going to still do, um, you know, they say if you find yourself uh, in a pit, in a hole, you should stop uh, digging. The problem you have uh, right there is that uh, they benefit from the uh, further digging of Nigeria into further hole. That will become so difficult to come out from except if we smoke ourselves out of it by force which is pretty much what's going to really happen at the end of the day they are insensitive they don't give a damn about uh, what anybody feels 
In fact, yeah, there are those who have already started their leaving them, resigning from them, the rest of them, and all that. And it seems that uh, it is only Peter Obi and his uh, gang somehow are creating the boss that they consider a threat at some point. Well, at this point, I don't know what it's going to be like, but they're going to relate through a lot of more that as themselves. But good luck to them. You call it sharp rage. There are things that really worries us, which they continue to underplay. One of them is this. They said you should go and get your uh, PVC. Go and get your PVC. I'll share this first, then I'll go to the next one. Here is one. Go and get your PVC, go and get your PVC, and all of that. They, uh, they don't give a damn about your PVC. They don't. Mara, you know, send a voter's card. We are the very voter's card for you. On that voter. Not just that. But when you have a chance of seeing criminals who have made Nigeria home, and then you see those who have uh, decided to make uh, Yoruba land the home of uh, where they will be doing the catch and release, catch for ransom, and then continue. Uh, to kidnap our own people. And the likes of Tifnumbu and Gang, they have no, they don't give a damn about it. They don't care. Not that some of uh, their followers also cares, by the way, but just imagine, if I, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to share this first. Then I'm going to say, imagine after listening to this, then re realizing that hundreds and thousands of people like that are totally above their law. And the least, uh, most of all these security guys in Europe, Ireland could do is to record them and share this uh, clip, nothing else. Because the same criminals are going to be back into the society because of somebody that uh, the likes of uh, Tifnumu brought upon us as a people, right? But I want you to listen to this first. Then you understand why when they said that Ashishi and the rest of all those things they are putting together for you for 2023, eh? you are going to praise Bukwari within months. It's obvious. Well, watch this first and I'll give it a follow up. Uh, what's the name? Musa Abdullah. Musa Abdullah. Mm. How old are you? You see? She can't Okay, uh, 38. 38 years. Uh, 38 years. Okay, where did they live? Uh, they live for Ikari. Did they live for Ikari? Uh, now you are from which state? Now from Casino. From Casino? Uh, what the car you come out of the rest of his? So, na kidnap. Eh? Na kidnap. Kidnap? Uh, okay, now how many people will they kidnap together? Na three people. How many people will they kidnap together? Will they do the kidnap? Okay, na seven people. Na, na seven people? Uh, you don't mention them? So, yeah. I know Bangaji, but uh, the remaining people now, I don't know the name. Know. Bangaji, you? Uh, you don't know the remaining people. Uh, then uh, how many people are not kidnapped? Now three people. Yeah, mention the amount. Mention so, the people. So Alaji Shaja. Uh-huh. Alaji Ilaro. Uh-huh. With the Da woman. Which woman? Da woman, why they say root. Why they say root? Uh, okay. Uh -huh. Where you are kidnapped Alaji Laro? Uh -huh. Which place not carry uh -huh. Alaji Laro? Na it's a root. Na. It's a root. Uh, it's a root. Uh, Alaji Shasha where you are carrying? Na Shasha. Na Shasha. Uh -huh. For a large session, we not kidnap. Now, how much we not collect? Now, four million. Four million. Uh, now, how much be your own? They give you three fifty. Three fifty. Uh, three hundred and fifty thousand. Okay. Uh, that woman, we not kidnap for it. We not kidnap for the road. Now, how much they give you? They give me fifty thousand. Fifty thousand. Uh, how much not collect that time? Uh, for that woman, how much not collect? Now, uh, one million. They say na three million but they no video there. Okay, before they cash you. Uh, okay. Okay. Is they hear the name? Alajila no. Alaja this and that. That's the one you have on camera. This is just to show that well, they exist. That's that's happening. They have their victims. If you don't pay them, they kill you. Then Tifnumbu. Because he won't be president. 
eh, decided to go and bring a jihadist. You have heard about Kabiru Shokoto Abi. Let me give you a quick reminder. This guy, that the just same way they went on to package Bokwari, unleash terror on the innocent people of Yoruba Lando, the innocent people of uh, Igbo Lando, the innocent people of Nigeria. They are not showing any kind of responsibility in their business. It is about winning. And then you see this Lagos above Bakus, this Ushogbo Alimajiris. They are now trying to justify the signing their death warrant. And guess what? I have a reminder too. So if you don't understand the concern, or even if you have not begin, if you are not, if you have not started uh, feeling concerned, eh? What they are cooking for you? By the time the Oten land, change next devil. They go be they go be like child's play. But now your choice, pick and well. I wait till God they pay me small, small. Be say they are using Yoruba, Yoruba name, Yoruba is a Yoruba man, it's Yoruba this and that to blindsight my people from what they actually have in stock for them. You are going to get used to paying your ransom for those kidnappings. You you are going to have to get used to, eh? Just screaming when they come to kill us. You have to get used to them sending every person that try to stand up against any of these Fulani terrorists or any of those other crimes they are going to unleash on you. They will send you to exile or they will send you to grave. And the reason for that is Tifnubu just want to be president. The terrorists they are bringing to him, you don't have a clue, do you? I'll tell you how that person feel about the Igbos. It's a point we should be reminding you. Uh, we try, we try, we did our best on this uh, book worry. Some of you still sign up for it. Some of you are dead. I mean, some of some of those who signed up for this are dead now. Some of those, uh, some of others are like a jobless, like poverty striking rights as we speak. Some others are currently have left Nigeria and run away. Others have, uh, you know, Nigeria have left them. They have run mad themselves and they are still in Nigeria. A lot has happened to so many people. Now they are about to cook another, where well, they have already cooked another one for you. Choose your poison very well. This person is the next vice president to uh, call you. And then, yeah, the terrorists themselves. It was Rocha State. He must state that they started saying that Hausa people must have yes. ID card to live in that state. Yes. Can you hear me? They say Hausa yes. people must have ID card to live in state. Yes. Until when we mobilize our people there and say, okay, in that case, all thousands must live now. Then Jonathan now realized that there was something going on. He said, no, these things have to stop. So are we mad? Do you get me? Count every yeah, five shops in this, in this north. Six, four shops are owned by Ibos. What, what is Ibos contribution in the economy? It's not trade. And fraudulent trade for that matter, including you. Ibos have cheated you. Unless if you are not buying spare tire, it's spare parts mm -hmm. and tires and medicine. So or not so? It's so allergic. Do you get me? Yet we accommodated them. Is it going to Dubai to buy to bring tech drugs that we don't we cannot do it? Now the plan is drugs now. No Igbo man will again sell drugs in this north. We are going to bring it from at Kano. It's drugs are brought by air. They are going to open okay. massive cooler school co co rooms in Kano and import it all north and maybe whatever we want to buy, come and buy from Kano. No Ibo will sell drugs again. We are tired of all this nonsense. We know how to control our places, the way they control their own. What we are saying is that we are all Nigerians. But we are going to learn what they are doing in South East and do it in the North too. Simple. Yes. We, okay, we, we don't have ancestors, but if, if Buhari today, as president of this country, want to buy land in the East, he will go and negotiate everything tomorrow. The chiefs will come and tell him that ancestors made them yesterday night and said they should not sell the land for them. So <laughs> we, we, we don't have ancestors. Or we are betraying ourselves. Yeah. We, my our ancestors, have told us that we have been careless. That's why we suffered for the past six years. <laughs> we have to wake up now. <laughs> Like no, it's a very serious thing. No, 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 no. I we cannot, sir. Your society is already adulterated. That's why, to be honest to you, let me tell you, to be honest to you, we never yes. wanted Buhari in this law, so we wanted the uh, Yes, yes. We want yes, that's it, what I'm saying. If it is Concorso, will have defeated Buhari. Listen to me. Uh, hey, you know the Tinibus and Co prefer, prefer, prefer Buhari. Because yes, they can, uh, is, is really tried, can you hear me? 
Because yes. Concorso will have solved this north south problem for us within six months. Hmm. In Kano, Concorso got us all the Igbos and told them that all these drugs that he closed, all those sex drugs they are selling in Kano. They know him now. Hmm. So that's why we wanted Concorso to be the, 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 the district. Igbos met in Abuja and one of after the election that they were the ones in charge of 75% of Abuja is their own. They should be given minister of. Can you imagine? Mm -hmm. Negotiate say this is the governor they want with their rule at everything. Ibo say no, he cannot be governor. Haba, haba, mm haba. -hmm. In somebody's land. In somebody's land. Haba kule. Haba kule. The arrogance is too much. <laughs> so, 10 years ago, I have won it. I say the Ibos are building nation within our nation. They will mm -hmm. engage us within our nation and reinforce from their nation. That is exactly what we saw during the tenure of Jonathan. Immediately we voted Jonathan. What we did to Jonathan in this north, Ibos, the Ibos in the north, their chiefs, gathered and came to Aso Villa. To the glare of yes. everybody on TV, they say it was nobody that voted, them, voted Jonathan, but the Ibos were the ones who voted him. Did you not hear that one? Did you not read it? In our own land, Ibos say we didn't vote Jonathan. It was they that voted Jonathan. Two, before elections again, they gathered themselves. And came and met Jonathan, I met in Abuja and said that they are directing all Igbos in the north must vote Jonathan. We don't mind. We don't mind. Let them vote anybody. But can you do that in the in the south southeast? They stop us from even voting. Let me answer this. I mean our left from Salam. We call let us in the night. Thank you. Can you hear me? Uh, in the southeast, all houses in the southeast were prevented from voting. Find out. Mm -hmm. Yes, find out. But yet, in our own land, they will stand and say that. Just it is, it is their problem that forced above Lagos to say that if if they don't, they try to frustrate the decision of the Eurobat, mm -hmm. they will send them to ocean. Mm -hmm. And I'm telling you, after four years. So at least not we are liberal, but in the southwest, Kule, after four years, Igbos mm -hmm. can never be use, useful, uh, relevant again in the southeast. Wait and see. Mm -hmm. can, in fact, the plan is the plan of APC is that they are going to make alliance of northwest economic development. The west has the ocean. Can you hear me? Yes. The north has agricultural produce. Yes. So what they are going to do, they are, the government is going to develop all the agricultural and mineral resources in the north. And then mm. they will put primary industries here. And then go yes. and export, the, finally finish them in Lagos or Southwest and export them and bring back the money and share it between the two regions. Let them bring their oil. This is the plan on ground. So I just thought I should remind you that is uh, your future vice president to to call you. I mean, your Obama no associate me with this. So do you understand that now? Don't ever associate me with this. So uh, and then uh, when they begin their their where well, they have already started anyway, because we've already started seeing uh, uh, Igbo versus Yoruba, Yoruba versus uh, Igbo. This and that. And when they begin all this, they are tribal. Uh, what do you call your tribal religious and where have you right? Just always have it at the back of your mind that uh, mm -hmm. no be all Yorubas support uh, Tifnumbu and no be all Yigbos are against Tifnumbu. Hello? There are Yigbos who are already grouping, trying to get their own share. Unfortunately, oh, listen, oh, Shibi, you have heard about uh, Joe Igbokwe, the special advisor to Sonweku on uh, gutter cleaning toilet cleaning at the same time as uh you know ass licking as well that's what i put it as like ass licking joe ibukui and people like him they went to tifnumbu if Numbu, the Igbos love you. We need we need to go and campaign campaign vigorously in the eastern nigeria don't worry the people love us she you in this they said if nobody told them that I'm not giving my money to any Igbo man. I'm not surprised. His wife said they don't trust the Igbo. So when you now begin your tribal tirade, when you now destroy your tribals, what have you, eh? 
Okuna, they try to spare me. Oh, I don't, I don't pay my dues. Okay. And please, when you now come around, don't say because somebody don't fire you somewhere. Tifnumbu slave somewhere, don't fire you somewhere, and you are an Igbo man. Suddenly, this Mayegun is an Igbo man. One way he came onto my platform. I was running a replay, um, I think it was yesterday or so. Then I was uh, I was reading the comments. And there was this mad man. I don't know if he's watching right now. Maybe a mad woman. One Wirisha came there and said, oh, no, no, don't, don't listen to this, my ego. That uh, my friend, my friend, that's what the guy said. He said, my friend, his friend told him that, you know, uh, when Jonathan was in power, eh, that Tinumbu gave money to this my ego to go and organize people in London. And they staged a massive protest against Jonathan. And he kept writing that there. I'm like, I know that uh, there are mad people on social media. There are mad people on the internet. But sometimes, eh, what could they check self? Even you self, if you'd be mad person. Once in a while, there's a reason I'm saying, I'm like, say, I'd I, I be mad man. And he was there writing. This my ego is campaigning for Tinubu Jare. Don't deceive yourself. He's working for Tinubu. My friend told me, very, very fact. I have evidence. Tinubu 